Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. okay, so welcome everyone to this week's seminar. So I think I don't have to introduce our speaker for very long. Many people, many will know him. So Rupert started his career at, at the University of Sydney as an honor student and then moved to France to Montpellier and worked together with Michele Fregerio. And since two years, he is in Brussels, at Brussels University, and has been working well, with different people there on kind of dark matter, neutrinos, flavor physics, and, and in this general area. And so today, we are very happy to have him here and give us a talk. Uh, he's visiting actually UNSW, but well, we are all in lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. And he will tell us about dark matter and neutrino lines from the CESA. So please, Rupert. Great, thank you very much, um, Mikhail. Um, I presume everyone can, can see my screen. Um, and yes, as, as Mikhail said, I am here in, in Sydney, as many of you know, and it's uh, wanted to thank uh, UNSW and him in particular for, for hosting me um, for, uh, for all of this year. I really enjoyed being part of the, the group and part of the, the community um, for the last seven or so months. Um, and I'm heading back to, to Brussels in a couple of weeks time, as, as some of you know. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about two uh, recent projects with some people in Brussels, um, connecting kind of dark matter and seesaw physics. Um, and I'm going to start off with an introduction, which will be fairly broad, because I know that there are people who work on, on all kinds of things in the group. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about the two projects which, which link the seesaw to the dark matter abundance and the dark matter lifetime in different ways. Um, so while most of this project, uh, you know, most of this talk will be about dark matter, it does start off with a seesaw. Um, so I thought I'd give a, a very brief review of the type one seesaw. Um, and so it's a very simple way to explain neutrino masses. You introduce uh, right-handed gauge singlet fermions, so they're, they're not charged under the standard model. Um, this is the, the NR. Um, and you can have basically two terms apart from the kinetic term. You can have a coupling to the standard model uh, Higgs and lepton doublet. Um, and also since they're uncharged, you can have a Majorana mass term here. And you can, um, you have the freedom to make this Majorana mass matrix real and diagonal, but the Yukawa matrix in, is in general uh, a complex matrix. And so you have a, uh, this introduces a mixing between the neutrino part of the lepton doublet and the um, sterile neutrinos, um, which is of order V times the Yukawa divided by the, the neutrino um, mass uh, or the, the, the sterile neutrino mass. Um, and so uh, as is reasonably well known, you get the light neutrino mass matrix um, here, which scales as, as uh, broadly speaking as, as, as Y nu squared divided by Mn. And so there's di different ways to explain small neutrino masses. You can make uh, the Yukawa very small. You could make um, the uh, Majorana mass uh, term very, very large, so typically say order 10 to 15 GeV, or you can have some cancellation between these as well, that's also possible. Um, and you want at least two sterile neutrinos to give you at least two non-zero um, light neutrino masses, um, which is you know, to be consistent with what we've measured. And if you want all three light neutrinos to be massive, then you need at least three sterile neutrinos. And so while um, the sterile neutrinos are certainly a viable dark mat matter candidate themselves, um, they, they also provide a very simple portal between the standard model um, and some kind of dark sector. Um, and so basically we saw with the Yukawa coupling that, that the um, sterile neutrinos couple to some dimension five on two uh, gauge singlet operator. And so you can do the same in the dark sector and that provides the connection. Um, and so you can come up with some kind of dimension five on two term, which is just a, a scalar and a fermion. And so you have some um, uh, dark sector coupling uh, or, or seesaw portal coupling of, of this form um, in general. And so, and so the, the stale, you see that the stale neutrino by coupling to the standard model and to the dark sector links the two sectors. Um, and so there's various ways to justify some kind of an interaction like this. Um, and kind of moreover to, to say forbid 
a similar term with with the chi coupling to the um uh, to the standard model because if the chi is uncharged then then, then the chi looks like just another stereo neutrino so you want to you want to give it some charge and and there's various different possibilities and they each have slightly different consequences um so probably the simplest thing you can do is have a z2 symmetry where the dark sector particles transform non-trivially while the standard model and stereo neutrino transforms uh, trivially you can extend this to some global u1 symmetry um, where the chi and the phi have opposite charge to allow this Yukawa and the standard model and stereo neutrino are uncharged. You can turn this global symmetry into a gauge symmetry, um, and then you can make this gauge symmetry some kind of non-abelian symmetry, for instance, an SUN where chi and phi are, are inputs. And so each of these have, have consequences. So if you have just a Z2, then your phi can be a real scalar. But if you have a global symmetry, then phi has a, is a complex scalar because it needs to have a phase. And then when, if you gauge the symmetry, then you get a gauge boson. Um, and if you have some non-abelian symmetry, then you have, have many gauge bosons, depending on, on what that symmetry is. So these all kind of uh, do somewhat of the same thing, but they have, they have different consequences. And so the two types of models I look at, um, the first is kind of this, this first case where you have just a simple Z2. Um, and then later I'll look at a case where you have a gauged symmetry and then you have a gauged boson, and that becomes very important. Um, and it's also worthwhile to note that in this kind of setup, in general, you have some quartic coupling, which couples this scalar to the standard model. Um, and that can introduce, say, mass mixing um, and, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, I'm just going to assume that the, the talk that this is um, some, some very small coupling so that this, this term is, is irrelevant. Now, um, something I want to talk about as well, which is relevant for the, the second part of the talk, is about dark matter stability. Um, we know very well that there are four stable particles in the standard model, um, the photon, the light of neutrino, the electron, and the proton. And they're all stable for very fundamental reasons. So uh, the photon is, is stable because it's massless, and it's massless because of gauge symmetry. The lightest neutrino is the lightest fermion. Um, the electron is the lightest charged particle, so that's uh, also stable due to gauge symmetry, um, and then the proton's due to, to baryon number symmetry, which is, is um, accidental, but it's not kind of ad hoc, it just, it just appears from the, from the theory based on the, the particles that, that we put into it. Um, and so we see that all these particles are stable for very fundamental reasons, um, and that kind of gives us a, an indication that perhaps dark matter is as well. Um, rather than, say, just being stable due to some, some Z2 symmetry that is, it is put in just by hand. Um, and so there's different ways that have been attempted in the literature to uh, explain kind of in a more fundamental way why dark matter might be stable. Um, so one of them, one nice way is, is minimal dark matter, where, where dark matter, just because of the multiplet it is in, um, is such that it doesn't have any normalizable interactions that lead to its decay. Um, another example is, is when you have hidden vector uh, dark matter where there's a, an accidental symmetry, which again makes it stable. So there, there's various kinds of alternatives in the literature for, for doing this kind of thing. Um, and, and then kind of going beyond that, um, if dark matter decays, this is quite an intriguing scenario because it presents uh, an additional way to discover dark matter, namely through um, observing its decay products. Um, and in particular, if that decay is to photons or to neutrinos, you get um, lines, either a gamma line or a neutrino line, um, which are, are, are typically considered to be dark matter smoking guns. And uh, however, we're left with the question of, you know, given that we all the particles that we know decay extremely quickly, um, how can you have a particle which decays with such a long lifetime. One way, of course, which is sometimes used is to have some extremely small coupling um, so that you know, the width is proportional to some coupling squared. You just make that coupling sufficiently small that the dark matter lifetime makes it essentially stable. Um, but that raises the question of why is you know, why do you have such a tiny coupling? Another possibly more natural way to consider um, dark matter that, that, that decays um, very, very slowly, is to um, have some suppression in the rate by some large scale, which amounts to kind of starting off with a, a dark matter model that is exactly stable 
and adding some UV physics that destabilizes it. Um, so we can think about that for a moment. And if you have, say, a dimension five operator um, that destabilizes your dark matter decay, then its rate just kind of dimensionally will, will be dark matter mass cubed or some massive, some massive thing cubed divided by the um, mass, the UV scale squared with an eight pi since you have a decay. And now if you say that this scale can't be any larger than the Planck scale, then this rate is still too quick um, unless the dark matter is less than about an MeV, very roughly speaking, given that, that the dark matter should be not only longer lived than the age of the universe, but in fact longer lived than, than you know, four or five orders of magnitude longer than the age of the, of the universe, because there were already pretty good bounds from um, measurements of, of, of gamma ray uh, and, and neutrino fluxes. So even if you have some dimension five suppression, it's probably not enough. Um, if you have dimension six, uh, a dimension six operator, which induces this decay, however, then the scaling is, is dark matter mass to the fifth divided by um, UV scale to the fourth. And so this does, this extra UV suppression does give you a slow enough decay, um, even for dark matter that is quite heavy, um, given a, a fairly large UV scale. So if you can um, have some physics at a very high scale, such as a seesaw um, scale, you know, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 GeV, then you can naturally get a really, really long lived dark matter. And you can expect that it decays into neutrinos because of this, ne this neutrino connection. And in this way, you're, you're connecting the smallness of neutrino mass with um, the, the long lifetime of, of dark matter, which is quite a quite an intriguing scenario. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the second part. But I thought I should just introduce this kind of philosophy, this, this, this framework um, in, the, in the introduction. Um, firstly, I'm going to go on to, um, with the seesaw portal, linking the seesaw to the dark matter relic abundance. Um, and then later, as I said, I'll talk about the lifetime. So we start off by taking the seesaw portal model that we introduced. And we, we, we don't have a gauge symmetry, we just have a Z2. Um, and then we have three stellar neutrinos, but we're only really focused on the first one. The, this, this lightest one is lighter than the electroweak scale, um, and the others are, are much heavier. Um, and then within this, we also assume that the um, Yukawa couplings of the uh, of the first one, first stellar neutrino are, are very, very small, so that it, it freezes in, while the others are larger. And this is kind of consistent with the neutrino mass formula, because that goes, as we saw, as the Yukawa squared divided by the mass. So smaller masses, smaller Yukawas, larger masses, larger, larger Yukawas. And so while these heavy, heavier neutrinos could be responsible for leptogenesis, I'm not going to talk about it um, anymore. And so as long as this sterile neutrino is lighter than the electroweak scale, it's produced dominantly by the decay of gauge bosons. Um, and that's proportional, you know, this decay width is proportional to the gauge boson mass. And then you have this Yukawa coupling squared and then some, some typical factors um, after that. And then, so you produce this sterile neutrino via freezing. And there's two different ways it can decay. It can decay into the dark sector using that, this neutrino portal coupling, uh, coupling to this, this chi and the phi, or it can decay back into the standard model, um, not into W or Z because it, it, it's lighter, but via the W or the Z into standard model fermions. Now, if the first dominates, um, which is, is a reasonable assumption, and, and we'll come back to that a bit later, if the first dominates, then all you can roughly say that all the stereo neutrinos decay into chi into phi, or to phi. And then the chi or the phi just kind of sit there. And so your abundance of phi and your abundance of chi is simply equal to the abundance of the stereo neutrinos that you produce in the first place. And so you can compute the stereo neutrino abundance by, by calculating the, 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 the rate as we did before and then integrating over time and doing a thermal averaging. And so in the end, you can find the abundance of this phi and this chi. Um, and it looks something like this. Um, and so the scaling is, you know, you have this, this dark matter mass and, it, and dark matter at the moment is, is multi-component, but whichever of chi or phi will dominate this. You have one on the stereo neutrino mass squared, and then you have the coupling squared. And then since the light neutrino mass goes as Yukawa squared divided by neutrino mass, this is um, 
basically roughly um, the dark matter mass times the neutrino mass divided by this by the seesaw um, scale and so or divide, divided by the sterile neutrino mass I should say and so you have this really nice relation where you're linking the dark matter abundance to its mass to the lightest neutrino mass and to the sterile neutrino mass so you have this very simple relation and then um, you, you can put in a strict inequality uh, which relates that this neutrino mass to these uh, these parameters um, this I is, by the way, is, is just a sum over, over lepton flavors. Um, and then since we have this simple relation, we can um, say that, that the lightest neutrino mass uh, in this scenario should be um, about 10 to the minus 12 EV, depending on the masses of the dark matter and the masses of the sterile neutrino. And this is very, very light. And, and the reason it is light is because the um, same very, very small coupling that went into the freeze-in of the sterile neutrino and hence of the dark matter is what enters into the seesaw formula for the light neutrino. So it's, it's the, the smallness of, of, of the freeze-in coupling, which is responsible for, for the smallness of the neutrino mass. And this model, it's, or the, the, this, this value, it's obviously very, very difficult to detect. We're nowhere near detecting anything with a mass of 10 to the minus 12 EV. Um, but certainly it can be um, uh, negatively proven. It can be ruled out by the various experiments looking for, you know, trying to measure neutrino mass, capturing neutrino less double beta decay, um, fairly, fairly good bounds from cosmology. Um, so you can rule it out even if you can't um, necessarily find something like this. But there's one thing that, that, that um, needs to be considered um, which is the decays of, of the chi and the phi, because we presumed just before that, that they're stable, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, so let's assume that chi is heavier than phi, but it, that, really that assumption doesn't matter at all. Um, but if it does, you have this decay chi to phi. No. If it were the other, round, other way around, of course, you'd have the phi decaying to the chi into the no. Um, and so this decay uh, scales as this um, uh, portal coupling squared times the, the mass um, times also the, the um, Yukawa, the seesaw Yukawa coupling squared divided by the um, sterile neutrino mass squared. And there's, there's two important limits. One is when you have extremely slow chi decay, which is where this Y chi is very small. Um, and the other one is where you have very fast chi decay, at least at, compared to the age of the universe. Um, we'd say when, when this Y chi is, is not so small. So let's firstly consider slow chi decay. And so you have a long lived chi um, compared to the age of the universe if Y chi is roughly the order of this, this freeze-in coupling uh, Y nu Y. And so now, now we, um, uh, we can expect to find neutrino lines because it decays to neutrinos and it decays with a lifetime that is roughly or slightly, you know, a bit larger than the age of the universe. So you can look for neutrinos. Um, and this is what this plot shows. Um, so let, let's look at this for a bit. So this is the, in the x-axis, we have the dark matter mass, um, m chi. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have the lifetime of this, of this decay, um, chi to phi nu. Um, and here we're assuming that m chi is much larger than m phi. For two reasons. Firstly, this means that chi is, is the dominant uh, contribution towards dark matter um, because the contributions scale proportionally to their mass. And secondly, if m chi is much larger than m phi, when it decays, the neutrino energy will be half um, the chi mass. Um, and so uh, we have the, the, the limit in green is from the age of the universe. Then we have various limits from various kind of neutrino uh, experiments um, that, that, that put a lower bound on what the life, in, uh, an observational lower bound on what that lifetime can be. I'll show a, a, a similar plot a little bit later when I'll, I'll, I'll explain this a little bit more. And um, in the meantime, I, I guess the important, the most important point is that um, these experiments typically, they, they look for neutrinos by measuring the flux of, um, anti-electron neutrinos and the process involved there is is inverse beta decay so they have um inverse so they have uh, electron anti-neutrino plus proton goes to neutron and electron 
and the kinematic threshold there is 1.8 MeV. So the, the lowest neutrino energy that they probe is 1.8 MeV. Since the neutrino has half the, um, the neutrino's energy is half the mass, that means they're probing um, dark matter mass as light as 3.6 MeV. And that's why this cuts off here um, and, and why you can't probe any, any lighter masses with these kinds of experiments. Um, and on the other hand, you have these black and red lines, uh, which I'll describe in the very next slide. Um, and so we have different, these different bounds for different scenarios. So if we take, say, the solid line, where we have a sterile neutrino of 1 GeV, then we have the black line, and then we have the red line is even stronger. And the key point here is that the, 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 the red and black lines are upper bounds, and these neutrino experiments give lower bounds. And there's not that much of a gap between them. Um, and, and, and a lot of these experiments are ongoing, or there are, there are some, there are, or in fact, there are, or, or there are upgrades or future experiments. So this is kind of a parameter space that isn't that large and can be probed um, in the, one could expect in the near future. So it's a somewhat promising um, situation. Um, as for what these, these bounds are, there's, there's, there's two things that, that we took into account. Firstly, we said way back that we wanted the sterile neutrino to decay to the chi and the phi rather than into standard model particles, because you need this to make this simple relationship um, connecting the, the dark matter abundance with the sterile neutrino abundance. Um, and this two-body rate, th this first process is proportional to uh, y chi squared times the neutrino mass. Um, and these latter ones um, are proportional to y nu squared times neutrino mass cubed. Um, and so the condition that, that the first one dominates um, gives the black line in the figures. And kind of, I guess the, the key thing here is that you want y chi to be sufficiently large um, here. And if, if so, so you put a, an upper bound on the lifetime because if the lifetime is larger, that means that y chi is smaller, which means that that, that first decay doesn't dominate anymore. So that, that's why this is, is an upper bound. Um, and the second thing that, that we need to think of is, is about some kind of other cosmological uh, constraints. So we're not concerned about ineffective, but what we are concerned about is the fact that we know that dark matter has to be um, reasonably cold. And uh, so the, the, the dark, the, the sterile neutrino has to decay into the chi or into the phi, and these particles have to be non-relativistic by temperatures of around keV. Um, we know this from, from structure formation. Um, and so this puts an upper limit on the, the chi lifetime. And again, the reason is that if y chi is really, really slow, then the, the n is, so if y chi is very small, then the n is still around or it decays very late. And so the, um, the, the chi and the phi are energetic. Um, whereas if the decay um, happens relatively sooner, then the, the um, chi and the phi's um, energy will kind of redshift away. And so they'll be cold by by KeV temperatures. So again, that puts an upper bound on the lifetime rather than the rather than the lower one. And so this, this, you know, having the combination of the upper bounds from those cosmological arguments and the lower bounds from these observations um, gives you a nice kind of tight region uh, where, where the model can lie. So that's that's what happens if if you have a small Y chi. You have a very different story if Y chi is large, um, because if it's sufficiently large. Um, which is to say that you know, the, the, the chi decays very quickly, then in fact you have a hidden sector that thermalizes. The, the sterile neutrino, the chi and the phi all go into some kind of thermal bath. And then you, you wipe out the initial information that you had. So you may wonder if you can still say anything about the dark matter abundance. And the answer is that you can, um, as long as the dark matter is a bit or a lot lighter than the other two particles, because then the dark matter will freeze out when it's relativistic. It, it'll freeze out at some temperature at the scale of one of the, the heavier particles. And so the dark matter abundance is given just by the temperature of the hidden sector. And so you can find the temperature of the hidden sector by finding the amount of energy injected into it by the W and the Z decays. And that, of course, depends just on the um, the uh, seesaw Yukawa couplings and the sterile neutrino masses. And so in the end, uh, you have a, a, a fairly similar relation um, connecting the dark matter mass to, sorry, the dark matter abundance to the, um, 
the C sort Yukawa coupling to the stale neutrino mass and to the dark matter mass. You have a slightly different scaling um, than before. And in the end, you need a slightly smaller um, neutrino mass. Um, and the reason, uh, sorry, you need a slightly smaller um, Yukawa coupling. And the reason is that thermalization tends to produce extra particles. So you need slightly fewer particles to start off with. Um, and so you can get away with a slightly smaller Yukawa coupling. Um, and this then means that you you have a site because because the stay on because the active neutrino mass um, or the, the light neutrino mass is proportional to this Yukawa coupling squared, then the limit that it puts on the lightest neutrino um, is, is is a little bit stronger. So which is to say you have you have a slightly lighter neutrino um, than before. Last time it was about ten to the minus twelve. Here it's about ten to the minus thirteen eV. Again, something that you can't expect to find really. Um, but something that uh, you can certainly rule out. And so, again, you're connecting uh, the smallness of the freezing coupling to the smallness of this, this neutrino mass. So to summarize this section, um, we, we see that there, there's a, a very simple seesaw portal. Um, and in fact, that allows you to connect um, seesaw parameters uh, with, the, with dark matter parameters and to connect the dark matter abundance with, with neutrino masses and, and really say that the, the neutrino mass scale should be very, very small. Um, and, and we saw that this mechanism works um, regardless of whether the dark sector coupling is, is weak, uh, in which case you have kind of freeze in and then freeze in again, um, or whether it's stronger and you, and you have a thermalization. Um, and that in, in, in the former scenario with the, this weaker coupling, dark matter lives um, for a very long time, but eventually it decays. Um, and that can give you a, a neutrino line that you have reasonably good prospects of observing. So this is this is the end of the first part. Um, so if there are any questions, now's a good time to uh, to ask them. Um, I had one question about that, Rupert. On oh, if not, I can happily go on to the second part. Rupert, uh, uh, Rupert, uh, Bruce has a question. Um, and so the uh, Rupert? Uh, in, in, in the second part, we're, we're looking at connecting the, oh, was, was somebody? Yeah, there, there was, Rupert. I can't, I, sorry, I can't hear the you. The sound's Bruce. misbehaving. Oh, there we go. Can you, can you go back to page 14? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, I'm just trying to understand the bounds in black. So, the, the bounds in red I get, I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're just sort of standard bounds that you get from inputting some external, some piece of external knowledge. But, yeah. mm -hmm. but the argument for the bounds in black is a kind of a consistency of scenario argument. Exactly. And so if that fails and you're above that line, it's not so much that it's impossible, it's that you're not actually in the scenario that you've been assuming. Doesn't that mean you have to uh, have to then go another step and ask, well, well, what is the situation? Um, uh, yeah, it, exactly. So, 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 say y chi is a bit smaller, so only a tenth of the of the decays go into chi into phi. Yep then indeed you have to adjust for that. And so you have to make some other parameter, you know, 10 times bigger or root 10 times bigger. Um, and then uh, the decay rate looks different again and, 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 and so forth. Um, but does so, that affect yeah, the it, conclusions? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, uh, I, I think it introduces another parameter that, you lose control. So you lose a, a bit of the control of, of what you're trying to say. So the, the nice thing here is that you have very few kind of new parameters. It's just, it's just you know, the seesaw parameters and that's it. And that's why you can link kind of um, the dark, you know, the dark matter with the seesaw very easily. If you have some kind of branching ratio fraction, which is a bit out of control, then yeah, m maybe the correlation between these different things isn't as, as straightforward. I, the model would still work. You'd still get dark matter. You'd still but probably you'd lose predictive have to have to want a, a, a small light neutrino, but you yeah you'd lose some of the correlations. Okay. All right. Thanks.
Okay. Um, so that's uh, that model. And now I'm going to go on to um, the second scenario, uh, slightly more involved one, where, as I mentioned in the introduction, we're interested in trying to explain why um, dark matter is so long lived um, and connecting that with the smallness of, of neutrino masses. Um, so we have a different kind of dark, excuse me, different kind of connection between the seesaw and dark matter. And so here we do have a gauge symmetry. I talked before about the different ways to um, justify this, this neutrino portal scenario. Before we had just a Z2, now we have a gauge symmetry, which means that we have um, gauge bosons. Um, it means that the phi is a, is a, is a complex scalar um, and it has a, a VEV, which spontaneously breaks this U1 symmetry. And so the, the, the gold stone of the phi is, is eaten by the gauge boson and the gauge boson has um, a mass. Um, and if the gauge boson um, is so massive that it's, it's heavier than, than twice the chi mass, then it can obviously decay um, and will do so very quickly at tree level. And so the, the dark photon is not stable, but the chi is. And so in this case, the chi is the dark matter. If, um, on the other hand, the gauge boson is not um, so heavy, and so this, this decay is kinematically forbidden, then both the um, the dark matter, sorry, both the dark photon and the chi are stable, and so you have this multi-component dark matter scenario. And so throughout this, by the way, I'm not going to talk about production, I'm just focused on, on stability and how to make that work. And so in the introduction, um, I said that you can start off with some exactly stable dark matter, um, and then you can introduce some UV physics, which destabilizes it. And that is a you know, perhaps quite natural and quite um, efficient way of explaining why the dark matter is, is so long lived. And here we, we already kind of know what this UV physics is. We're going to have the seesaw. And so we couple um, the, 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 the dark sector um, uh, as before, but but we we in fact break it down into into um, two components to, to chi left and to chi right, each with the couplings y left and, and y right, um, which we'll see is is important. Um, and so this uh, will destabilize the the dark matter, um, but in two different ways. Um, so both the chi and the a prime, the star photon, do decay, but with different rates. So let's look at the the dark photon decay, and we have this Feynman diagram here. And so we have this, this tree level coupling to the chi's, and then the chi um, interacts with, with the serial neutrino via this y left or y right coupling, and then via the seesaw interaction, um, the serial neutrino interacts with the, the Higgs and then um, say a, a, a neutrino. So this, this gives you the um, dark photon to nu nu bar um, decay uh, at tree level. And the, the crucial thing here is that you have two lots of this mixing. Um, and so you, you have in the amplitude, you have two stereo neutrino propagators. So you have a one on Mn squared in the amplitude. So in the decay rate, you have one on Mn to the four. And that's exactly what we saw was with, with what you needed. You needed four, um, you needed a suppression by four powers of the UV scale in order to have a sufficiently long lived dark matter. Uh, and so this, this is this is what we have here. And, and this this rate is kind of, it's it's almost exactly what you expect. You have four powers of the VEV, you have four powers of the phi VEV, you have the gauge coupling here and, and the um, seesaw Yukawa. The, the one kind of slightly odd thing here is that you have this Y left squared minus Y right squared, um, which is essentially because you have uh, the chi left and the chi right running into the loop. Uh, and so they have a, a destructive interference. Um, so we want y left um, not to be equal to y right, um, and, and th this can also be understood in terms of the 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 um, mixing the mass mixing matrix of, of the light sorry of, of the neutral fermions. Um, but otherwise, uh, the kind of the, the headline the fact about this is that you have four uh, uh, four powers of, of the stellar neutrino mass um, in this in this width, and and here. Um, we're assuming that this serial neutrino is very heavy. So in, in the first part, in the last um, uh, kind of project I was talking about, we were considering a much lighter serial neutrino mass. 
now when it, we, we're thinking about this more in the typical seesaw scale of, of 10 to 15 GV, something like that. So you, you really do have a suppression. Um, and there's an interesting feature here, which um, has been discussed before, but it was something that I wasn't aware of, and I think is, is, is quite interesting, which is that um, the three and four body decays can actually dominate over the two body decays. Um, and usually we think of, of, you know, body, so of decays which have more bodies as being additionally suppressed because of, of, of extra factors of phase space, typically something like 16 pi squared per extra final state particle. Um, but what happens here is that if you take, say, a Higgs VEV, um, that in, the, in this diagram that gives you a factor of V or V on root two, um, but if you replace it with a physical particle, so you have a, a Higgs or a Z here, then that comes with the power of the momentum in the loop, um, which is basically um, M uh, A prime. And so if uh, M A prime is sufficiently large compared to the VEV, then this phase-based suppression is compensated for by, by powers of MA prime over V. So we look at this, this tree-level rate, so the width, if you take only this tree-level amplitude for this two-body decay, um, goes as V to the four times MA prime. But for adding up all the three-body processes, it's V squared MA prime cubed. And for the four-body, it's V, as so there's no powers of V, and it's MA prime to the power of five. Um, and so this three body dominates over the two body um, when MA prime is, is more than about 2.9 TeV, which is roughly four, four pi times V. And the four body dominates for when it's about 12 TeV. This happens, by the way, um, only when, when you replace the Higgs VEV, because if you, if you replace the five VEV, then you get factors of MA prime over V5, um, but that's, that's equal just to the gauge coupling. Um, so there's no enhancement, you can't make that thing very large. Um, and so we've looked at two body decays, we've looked at three and four body decays, but the other thing to, to look at is, is um, uh, loop decays. Um, and this is more important than one might think because as uh, the Myron dark matter has been studied before, Myron being the Goldstone boson of a complex scalar which, which generates the Myron mass term, um, and in myron dark matter, the tree level decay scales as one on m n to the four. But once you have loop level decays, some of them scale as one on m n squared. And so the decay actually goes a lot faster at loop than it does at tree. Um, and so in the end, you actually need to have either a very light myron or very small couplings. And so kind of the whole idea of, of getting um, long lived dark matter without any small couplings in the end, you, you, you're not able to realize that, that scenario. However, in this scenario, you, you can. Um, and uh, so we looked at the various loop diagrams. The dominant one is this diagram on the left here, and where we have a Z in the loop. Um, and then uh, as long as, as kind of the other scales, the, the dark photon and, and the chi mass are much larger than, than the electroweak scale, then the, it, taking the loop part of the amplitude only gives you a decay width that, that looks like this. Um, and so it, it's, you still crucially have a one on stereo neutrino mass to the power of four. Um, and much like the three and four body processes had fewer powers of V, here, because of the loop, you also have few pow fewer powers of V. Um, you have, in fact, you have no powers of V, um, you just have V by to the fourth times MA prime. Um, and this large log. It's also interesting to note that there are many other loop decays, and in particular, the rate of dark photon decay to charge leptons is at leading order the same, because you can take this dominant loop with the, the Z and the neutrinos, and you replace it, and you put in a W, and you charge leptons, and just by gauge invariance, this is at leading order exactly the same. Um, and there's also other loops where, say, you put a fermion in the loop and you emit two gauge bosons and, and, and things like that. Um, but the, 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 the fact that I mentioned that you have this enhancement, you have no powers of V in the amplitude, is really important um, because it means that at high masses, this dominates over not only the tree level decay, but it dominates over the, the tree level three and four body decays. Um, 
And this is crucial because we're looking for a neutrino line, a neutrino line being a, a really clear signal that you can see at, at some kind of experiment or some kind of neutrino telescope. And if at large masses a four-body decay dominates, it's, it's a lot harder to detect than a, than a two-body decay where, where you have this neutrino line. Um, so it, it, it turns out quite nicely um, that you have this um uh that 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 this that this um uh two-body decay always dominates the low masses it's the tree level and then at higher masses because you have no powers of v um you you, you just have powers of, of uh v phi to the fourth and ma prime at higher masses this loop um decay uh dominates so now um, we can look at, at experiments. Um, and so this is the plot that I alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, and this is a plot which is uh, the case not just for this model, but for any kind of model where dark matter decays into neutrinos. And this is a bound on its lifetime. Um, a lot of the hard work was done by uh, Camilo Garcia, Seely, and Julian Heek um, when they're looking at, at Myron dark matter. And so quite a few of these bounds have been re reappropriated from that, um, plus a few. Uh, additional ones added on um, and so you have you have bounds this is assuming that the dark matter decays in a flavor universal way into neutrinos although in the end it, it's fairly insensitive to this assumption because uh say you know be, because basically neutrinos oscillate from from the, the time when they decay to get to here and so the the mix of the flavors is, is pretty close to one to one to one um no matter how they decay even if they decay only to a single flavor um, so th there's a few different types of bounds. Firstly, dark matter should be longer lived than the age of the universe. Secondly, you have this, this uh, bound, which is stronger by about a factor of five from cosmology, uh, which would say that basically, if dark matter decays into neutrinos, suddenly kind of a bit of the, the kind of universe's energy budget that you were going to, that, that was being called matter is, is radiation. And so to compensate that in, in, in your cosmological pitch, you have to put in um, a bit more dark energy and you have to change the time of matter radiation equality and that leads to, to various constraints um, that, that people like Yvonne I'm sure know a lot more about than, than I do. Um, these low energy constraints come from um, neutrino uh, e experiments, you know, Barxino, Camelan, Supercamericunda, and, and as I explained before, that comes from um, looking at um, anti-electron uh, neutrinos um, by this inverse beta decay process. At higher masses and, and therefore higher neutrino energies, they look for atmospheric neutrinos. Um, and then at, um, there's this interesting Fermi gamma bound, which is where they look at um, gamma rays. This is Fermi lat, and you think, well, what, what gamma rays have to do with neutrinos? And it turns out that energetic neutrinos will emit some, some, uh, some radiation, some, some, some photons basically from, from Bremsstrahlung. Uh, and so you can look at uh, uh, Fermi and, and put a bound on, on dark matter decaying into, into very energetic neutrinos in that way. Um, and then finally, you have neutrino telescopes. This is, this is Ice Cube in particular. So you really have a, a, a lot of very good bounds across a, a fairly broad um, mass um, scale. In fact, it goes to even higher masses. It doesn't stop here. Um, and it's really, they're very strong. I mean, you, you're getting up to something that's 10 orders of magnitude larger than the um, age of the universe. And you know, neutrinos we think of as being fairly weakly interacting. So th this is this is fairly um, impressive observational constraints. And so we put this together and, and we, we use all these constraints to um, you know, apply it to our model. Uh, and, and we try to get a bound on the seesaw um, uh, the, the, on, on the seesaw scale. And so to do this, we set all the couplings to order one. Um, this gives us the strongest constraint. So if we have these couplings that are smaller, then the seesaw scale can be smaller um, because the, the rate you know, of, of the decay goes as you know, couplings to some power divided by um, cell neutrino mass to some power. Um, and then again, we say flavor universal decays. And for simplicity, we say that the chi mass and the dark photon mass are the same. Note that that doesn't have to be true uh, at all. And so we see that, that the bounds get stronger um, as uh, the dark photon mass gets stronger, um, which is expected. But you have this uptick here. 
and this is where the the uh, loop level decay takes over at some kind of couple of hundred GeV. And so you have a different scaling there. And the reason is because when you have the tree level decay, um, so V phi, M chi, and M A prime are all the same in this you know, simplifying approximation. So the rate scales essentially as M A prime on M n to the fourth. So M n grows as um, M A prime to the power of one on four. So quite weakly, um, given some fixed decay width. When the loop level decay takes over, um, you have something, you know, V phi is equal to MA prime. And so you have, it scales as MA prime to the fifth power divided by MN to the fourth. So MN scales as, as MA prime to the five on four. So you have a much stronger dependence on the dark photon mass, which is why you have this kind of uptick in these much stronger bounds. And so really for a dark photon mass um, above, you know, 100 GV, you're really probing a high C source scale, 10 to 16 GV up to, you know, close to the Planck scale. So you're getting pretty good bounds. Um, as I said, these bounds are weaker if you, if you assume smaller couplings. Now, the kind of last thing to say here is that so far we've talked about the dark photon, but there's also the chi, because in the initial model before we introduced the seesaw, we had this, you know, we had both the dark photon and the chi as dark matter. And the chi will decay much faster because there's only one transition. So the life, the, the lifetime of the chi scales as mn to the square, mn squared, whereas for the dark photon, it was mn to the power of four. And these decays are into the standard model particles. And so you, you really got to worry about things like BBN um, because uh, certainly, you know, injecting um, energy, injecting this kind of stuff will, will, will have some, you know, conceivably quite severe consequences for, for BBN. Um, and given that dark matter was very long lived, um, you know, talking about 10 to the 25 seconds, you, you might worry that the kite is just too long lived. How can you have, on the one hand, such a long lived dark matter and at the same time, such a, um, a, a short lived chi, given that it's the same you know, model and the same parameters which control them? And the fact is that you can actually, you can get away with it. So this is um, the plot. Uh, this is the dark photon mass on the x axis. This is the lifetime of chi. Put in a, a, a some somewhat conservative bound bounds of, of of one second for BBN, and we want dark matter to, to sorry we want the chi to decay before one second. Um, and to get this plot, what we've done is we've gone back and taken the 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 smallest sterile neutrino mass um, allowed. So if it's 100 GeV, then this mass is is, is about you know, five times ten to the fifteen GeV, uh, and so that that's the value of MN that I've taken for each value of, of MA prime. And so we see that um, as long as the dark uh, photon mass is large enough, or as long as M chi is heavy enough, then this decay does happen quickly enough. And it, it's kind of slightly illuminating to, to think about why this happens, because one sees that there's this kind of funny ratio, which is that the time of BBN divided by kind of roughly the time that dark matter should be around for, so 10 to the 25 seconds. This is a ratio of one to 25, sorry, one to 10 to the 25, which is about the same as the ratio of neutrino masses to the seesaw scale. And then, so when you take the ratio of the chi and the dark photon lifetimes, um, and here for simplicity, I'm, I'm taking the dark photon lifetime when the, the tree leveled part of the amplitude dominates, then this ratio is exactly this, this M neutrino over seesaw scale um, factor times something involving a bunch of couplings and, and scales, which could be kind of almost anything, times the ratio of masses. So if you're able to either um, increase the sterile neutrino mass while keeping the light neutrino mass fixed, or um, you know, perhaps quite obviously, if you are able to increase the mass of the chi um, with respect to the dark photon mass, then you can make the, the then you can make the chi sufficiently short lived. The reason um, why why um, increasing the mass of the chi relative to the a prime is, is kind of a fairly simple solution is, is just because typically the the, the um, decay rate of a particle is proportional to its mass. So 
if you increase the chi mass, um, then it will have a faster decay rate or decay earlier compared to the A prime. And while we want the um, the, uh, the 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 chi mass must be at least half the A prime mass, so that the A prime doesn't decay into into two chi's. But in fact, the chi could you know, be much much heavier than the A prime if you, if you wanted to. There, there's no reason why it, it it shouldn't be. So that's kind of an easy way out to to make this ratio um, what you want. Um, the final thing to to add is is that kind of as I as I foreshadowed in in my introduction, you can extend this um, and make a uh, not just a gauge two one, but some gauge non abelian uh, sorry non abelian gauge symmetry like an SU two, and then everything really proceeds um, as as normal. Uh, you, you make the chi and the scalar to be doublets or, or, or endlets. Um, all of the 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 rates and all of the the phenomenology is basically the same up to some factors. Um, and and you always get this important one on steel neutrino mass to the fourth uh, power in the decay rate. The advantage of this, um, obviously, there, there's the complexity of, of dealing with more particles of, of more gauge bosons and so forth. The advantage is that we neglected kinetic mixing, um, and indeed kinetic mixing could be uh, a problem um, in general if, if you were to include it because you can have the, the dark photon going into the standard model photon. Which then, you know, uh, which then will induce a decay. Um, of course, if you have a, a non-abelian gauge symmetry, then there's no kinetic mixing. So that's just a very, very simple way to, to get out of, to get out of that problem, um, and and you're fine. Um, so putting everything together, um, we we kind of built a model of, of of dark matter where you do have the possibility of detection by its decay, um, and um, a way where it, it, its long lifetime was was natural. I mean, in, in the first part, the dark matter had a had a long lifetime because you had kind of couplings that were very small because we were talking about freezing. Um, but here it was just due to the UV physics scale, and it's not always easy to get this this long lifetime. For instance, in the Myron, so in the Myron dark matter case, um, you have it run into a problem at one loop. But here, the situation is is stable um, even at loop level. Um, and this, this neutrino portal means that you can decay to neutrinos, which is a, a, an int interesting final state to observe. Um, and so in the end, you have some, some connection between the dark matter lifetime and the neutrino masses. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Rupert, for a very interesting talk. Um, are there questions? Maybe let, let me ask the first question. So, so you mentioned okay. kinetic mixing there in the end. Yeah. Uh, so in, in your U1 model case, wouldn't you always induce kinetic mixing? Yeah, yes. So, um, well, it, it, in the loops, we indeed we have something which looks a bit like kinetic mixing here. This is this, yeah. this loop where you have um, the Z. And so that's, that's sufficiently small um, that, that, that the rate still scales as one on m into the fourth power. Um, so you do induce kinetic mixing, but it's very small. Um, but the problem is, is that we set it to zero at tree level. And so you should put in something at tree level, some kind of parameter. And it means that you know, the parameter that you put in at tree level has to be either zero or at least something very, very small, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so which is, uh, yeah, which is, is against kind of the philosophy of, trying to make dark matter long lived without any small couplings, which is which is the aim here, because we have put in one small coupling. Mm -hmm. Because in principle, couldn't you also do it via the scalars? So create uh, generate kinetic mixing. So you have the Higgs mm -hmm. uh, and you have your dark Higgs, right? The phi. Yeah. Uh, and both get a F. So both will um, Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you be able to generate it at two loops? Is that right? No. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so dark photon. Yeah. So so. Um, well, f first of all, there's there's not a dark photon coupling to phi phi. Ah, true, true, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's... Um, which is is kind of the nice thing here, um, and and oh, that's oh, there's a, yeah, that there's a residual, um, kind of. Yeah, almost parity symmetry, which 
forbids that decay. Um, and so therefore that kind of kinetic mixing, or I mean, yeah, I, we didn't consider things at two loop. And yeah, yeah, no, no, that no, no, might, no, no. I think might be yeah, dangerous. Doesn't 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 yeah. But I think there are more questions. Yeah. Uh, Arthur or Tobias, do you want to ask a question? Or is... Go ahead, Tobias. Yeah, um, I have a question about this um, coupling of the Higgs doublet to, uh, I think it was phi squared, which you mentioned um, at the beginning of your talk. And I think, uh, yeah. oh yeah, also also here. And you always say it's very small. Um, yeah. Just because you don't want to focus on on that and not think about it anymore, or is that because you're, uh, is that due to physics such as you're afraid of, I don't know, and uh, destabilizing the Higgs mass or so. Yeah, um, I think where, so um, the answer is a little bit different depending on, on the two of, uh, depending on, 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 on which kind of part. In this part, it's not too bad. Um, you introduce some mass mixing between the phi and the Higgs because they both have verbs. And so, and that, will you know, if, if that mixing is really very very large then you might you might have some some experimental bounds mm -hmm. but this coupling i think can be still you know not not that small and and things are and it, it's not too bad um so in this in this model it's it's just just for convenience um just to make calculations easier it's not so bad in 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 the first case it is um for a couple of reasons. Um, so firstly, we wanted to say that the stellar neutrinos were produced only by uh, Z and W decays. Um, but if you have this quartic coupling, then you uh, also have a production by Higgs scattering, which is yeah. conceivably quite significant, especially since this Y nu is really very small. It's a freezing coupling. So even a, even a small quartic coupling would be quite significant. So we want that to be kind of the size of Y nu or, or in fact, even smaller. Um, and then secondly, I think you worry about phi decay, especially if you don't have a Z2 symmetry and then you have some, some um, uh, cubic term, phi H dagger H, and then you can have some kinds of, of phi decays, um, which will destabilize the whole model. Um, so one can put in a Z2 symmetry or something like that to forbid the cubic term, um, but still there, there's you know, conceivably uh, issues there. So, so it, in this first part, it, it, that it's a more severe problem. Thanks. And thanks for the talk. <laughs> thanks. Um, other questions? Uh, maybe I have another one. So, so with those decays which you considered, so you mentioned mm -hmm. um, that the loop level decays are also suppressed with the one on MN to the four, um, yeah. and that, that's different from the Myron case. Yeah. So, what's the exact reason? Do you, or is there a simple reason? Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, I, I skipped over the Myron case a bit. I have. Yeah. So, so in, in the Myron, you have this decays in neutrinos, which goes as the scale to the fourth and, and then at loop level to child leptons. Um, it's to do with chirality. Um, it's to do with the fact that the, so let's go back to the loop diagram. Um, it's to do with the fact that the um, gauge boson is a vector, um, whereas the myron is, is a scalar. Um, and so just kind of when you do the loop um, diagram, you, uh, you it's something about the, the number of masses that you count in the loop and so you have mm -hmm. some you, you pick a mass um yeah yeah so so you have the same loop but you have an n and you you, you have to pick up one mass in the loop and so that becomes one of the the heavy ends and so you oh, have oh, wow. you pick only up. one on m in the loop whereas here with the vector you only pick up momenta and so you have one on mn squared. Fairly sure that that's what goes on. It's actually, um, this is known also in, um, in the standard model because there are statements about kind of um, top, the, uh, I think top to, to bottom and to the W uh, or, and then that's different from, 
oh, there's, 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 I forget exactly, but there are different loop diagrams where, where you're worried about the, the top and the bottom and then whether the, whether you have a gauge boson or a scalar and, and, and the, in the limit where the top is very, very, very heavy, which is, you know, what they used to consider, um, there's some things that you can look at. I forget, I forget the story, but basically it's chirality. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, it's an interesting um, thing. And this is also, some of these, these things were picked up um, by a paper just a little bit before ours by Profumo and others at the end of 2020, um, where they have not exactly the same model uh, at all, but they they look at some similar things. And they make this, this comment about the, the loop diagrams. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, any last question? If not, at the moment, then let's thank Rupert just in the interest of time. I think you finished the official part, but if you have more.